Welcome to Law and Justice. I'm Jane Mulcahy. Today, this is a special feature on how to talk policy and influence people. And I'm really delighted to be joined by Dr. Eben Joseph. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a delight to be here on your program. Super. So, um, Eben, maybe you could tell me a little bit about yourself to begin with, please. Um, okay, so talking about myself can take the whole day. Excellent. So, but I'll just, <laughs> I think I will just tell you the quick things, you know, that are relevant to these. Um, I'm, I'm here in Ireland. I'm, I, I live in Ireland. Um, and my background is a degree in microbiology, but I work um, with the Royal College of Surgeons um, as a career development um, consultant. So I work with med students, supporting them to navigate the labor market here in Ireland. Um, but I have a doctorate in um, social justice from UCD. And as a result of that, I have done a lot of work around, uh, my research was on labor market mobility, um, looking at inequality within the labor market. So I have done a lot of work looking at people who migrate to Ireland and how they navigate the labor market. So I have worked with, um, I lecture black studies. So I started the first black studies module here in Ireland in UCD, but I also lecture in Trinity College um, in race, ethnicity and identities and uh, yeah. Okay, super. Thank you for that very brief and succinct intro. Um, you also wrote a book, and we'll talk about that a little bit later about races and uh, race and employment. Um, but Ebon, can you maybe help me a little bit with um, definitions or terminology before we get into anything else? Um, I work in academia or in research myself, and I've used the phrase in the past black people and I have been corrected by white people saying this is actually not appropriate terminology. Um, can, can you give me any guidance in that? Because obviously you have black studies and we have Black Lives Matters. In my own modest opinion, I would think there's nothing wrong with saying black people. Am I right or am I confused? Um, so again, and, and that's, uh, it, so it's still an ongoing debate, you know, like what is the way to, you know, so black people, you know, when you say black people that nobody's black, it's just, you know, like you're saying white people, yeah. you know, so nobody's yeah. white, nobody's black, you know, uh, and so naming terminology has been, uh, it's, 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 you know, really been a, a huge issue, you know, because when we say black people, you know, um, it's it's like you know your your group that identity so you have ascribed that identity onto them you know um but yeah so people who are black you know so again people of color uh -huh. you know so every terminology has is problematic so when you say people of color then you say you know people are you know people don't have a color you know people of color means everybody yes you know so really it's <laughs> you know it yeah it's tricky you know then we say blacks you know, when we say that, then that has a, when we say whites, you know, that has a, a, a huge problem, you know. So I guess at the end of the day, you know, it is, you know, when you define, you know, what you're saying, you know, so when we write, you know, depending on what you're saying, when you define um, how you use a term, you know, so for example, when I say um, people who are black or people who are, so for me, I prefer people of African descent. Okay. Want to so in my writings as much as possible, and I know it's a mouthful, mm -hmm. but when I write, for me, what is what I would prefer if people were referred to by their descent, you okay. know. So if you want to have to refer to anything at all, I would prefer that we refer to people by their descent. So you say people of black, Af you know, people of African descent, or mm -hmm. if you say people of black African descent, mm -hmm. you know, uh, do you understand? So I that means that you're saying they are, it is a descent. But when you say blacks mm -hmm. or black people, it's almost like we're ascribing the identity, the, the stereotypes and all of those things that come with that um, identification. But if we say people of black African descent, you could be of a descent and be of a different ethnicity. So it's like an opening, it's like a beginning, it's like an entry, you know, into who they are, you know. And I know that is much more difficult, you know, like when you're, when you're writing, when you're talking, you just want the shortcut, you know. Mm -hmm. So you just want to say blacks, you just want to say people who are black, or you want to say black people, you know. Yes. But also, I... I also try and get people, particularly my white friends, to be comfortable, 
you know, saying, you know, people who are black, mm. you know. So because, you know, we, we dance around the word, we, we make it almost sound like if it's a, it's a dirty word, yes. you know, like... Yeah. Word. It's not a swear word, so don't be afraid of the yeah. word because we use it all the time. We're thinking it, so yeah. open your mouth and say it. You know, so yeah. um, so, yeah. so that's, you know, so that's very helpful. That's very helpful. I think. So I encourage my friends. I encourage people who are around me to. I say, say it, but you know, say say black. You know, yeah. oh, yeah. I have a I have a colleague. You see, I'll, yes. I'll, I'll try and rephrase that. So when you say, I have a black colleague, yeah. you see, what you have identified first is the blackness of the person yes. before the person is a colleague. Yes. But when you say, I have a colleague who is black, mm -hmm. then the person is first a person before their color, you yes. know? So it is how you use it. So, so be comfortable saying black, be comfortable saying white, mm -hmm. you know, I don't just see race as something that is only black people or white people, you know, that is only black people, that all of us are raised. So the same way we have black people, we have white people. Do you understand? I do. You know? Yeah. yeah so, because, so Sorry, Ibun, but from um, a human rights perspective, I suppose that makes a lot of sense because in the disability sector, it's a person with disabilities, not a disabled person. Um, so it's the same principle that it, we're not defined necessarily by the color of our skin. And yet so many experiences that people who are black have are partly because of that aspect, you know, that that racist dimension. But that's very helpful. It's just that, you know, knowing how to swap it, you know. So let us see the person first before we see their color. Let us see a doctor who is black, you know. Yeah. Oh, I, I was treated by a doctor and he happened to be black. Yeah. Do you see? Yes. So it's not happening. Yes. You have first identified them as a person, yes. you know. But when you yeah. don't see the black first, then mm -hmm. you paint for me, you bring up all the stereotypes, you know, and all the, yeah, that comes with that. Um, I personally would not have ever used the phrase or the word blacks, but the, it was referred to in a recent report about Garda perceptions of people of various backgrounds and they had very negative views about travelers, um, quite negative views about people who are black and also Arabs and the phrases used. Do you think in general um, that that people, you know, at the front lines, whether it's criminal justice and guardi or doctors or social workers, whatever, could benefit from some training about, you know, these issues, human rights and race and how to be sensitive and how to connect as humans on the human level and not be blinded by um, issues like skin color and be awkward because of it. I think it's absolutely vital, you know, that um, from the guardi down to social workers, that everyone, and sometimes I think we even make the mistake and in assuming that because a person, you know, is uh, has a black skin color, you know, um, that they understand as well. No, you know, because particularly if the person has grown in the Western world, you know, if the person has grown in the Western world, their education has completely um, eradicated every, um, you know, knowledge, you know, uh, of, of, of Africa and people from the African continent. We have actually raised you in a Eurocentric way. Mm -hmm. You understand? You know, so, so we, we all would, dis, you know, benefit absolutely from it, you know, to, I, I call that like culturally sensitive um, hearing, you know, how we are able to be sensitive culturally to how we teach, you know, how we talk to people, how we name people to understand that even the categories that we have, that they are not value free, that they have an impact, you know, on, on how we perceive and how we work with people. Absolutely. You know, they, they need training massive, like in Ireland, we, you know, I do, in, in, when I do some exercises, when I'm teaching, I give the first exercise, tell me, you know, all the good things i'm not saying anything tell me the good things that you know about people who are black tell me the good things that you've been taught in secondary in university about people who are black and they all talk about um the you know everything from the 
what is it now, you know, from, from, from slavery, okay. you know, and how we overcame slavery, um, you know, so we go back to civil rights, you know, I'm like, uh, you do know that civil rights, even while it was to um, free people, it was not a good thing. Right. You know, so you talk about the struggle. You've gone yes. again into the struggle. Yeah. You know, so if everything you know about people who are black um, or people who are categorized as black um, is um, about their struggle, you know, then what has it? It has created again that white superiority. You yeah. understand? Yeah. We are constantly trying to free a group of people. So that's what you've been taught. So our system raises us up to be white supremacists. Mm -hmm. So even when you're black and you um, go through our education system, our education system teaches you to inferiorize yourself. Yeah, which it teaches you to see yourself. Absolutely. You know, it starts by teaching you a negative aspect of yourself, you know. It, it just makes you hate, yeah. you know, uh, uh, yeah. being, uh, uh, being um, in that group. You know, so that's our education system. So for us to be anti-racist, we need to be taught. Nobody woke up one day and was a guard. Nobody woke up one day and became a doctor. Mm -hmm. They were trained and we were taught. So we cannot, I cannot expect the guard to become, uh, to be aware, to be an anti-racist, you know, by osmosis. You know, they have to be taught. They have to learn it. And that has to come either through our education system or that they take further training and um, to know how to work with people. I mean, like in the last few months, I have just been exhausted with stories upon stories, you know, from groups, people's experiences, you know, with the Gadi, people's experiences in our, in our primary schools, in our secondary schools, as young as five-year-olds, you know, you know, talking about, you know, their experiences in schools, you know, secondary school kids talking about their experiences in our education system. It's out there. They, those kids put their faces behind it because yes. they've just had enough of it. Yes. You know, so people need to be trained. Our teachers, social workers, you know, we need, we need training. Yes, I'm really glad you, you raised the teachers and I was going to ask you about schooling because I've, I've small kids myself, they're in primary school and they've, they've children from all countries in the world at this stage in their class, unlike me when I was in school you know, everyone was white and Irish. There weren't even Eastern European people or people from other countries in Europe. Like Ireland has changed a lot in the last 20 years. But um, our education system hasn't caught up with that in terms of getting to grips with cultural sensitivity and having no tolerance for bullying and particularly racist bullying. And even, as you say, just the type of curriculum that we teach and the messages that we give. Um, before we go on to that, can you just tell me, in, 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 because one of the reasons I really wanted to speak to you was about Black Lives Matter, uh, the whole movement, and um, how really in some ways the world has changed or we're at a moment of, of huge potential growth, hopefully. You know, it's quite volatile in the States. Um, I know it's very volatile. There are riots and people are getting hurt and killed. But the murder of George Floyd captured people's imagination and the video of that woman in the park, Amy Cooper with the man in, 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 in Central Park, kind of showed what black people or people who are black have known for a very long time, that the world is not a very safe place necessarily. Um, what has this movement meant to you, Ebun? I think that, you know, I think one of the things that it has done you know, particularly, you know, since um, May 25th with the killing of George Floyd, you know, um, and, you know, Amy Cooper's um, actions, you know, performing racism, is that it has removed the blinkers because one of the biggest challenges we've had is whenever we talk about race or racism or the experiences of racism, even when people are hit with, you know, statistics and data and experiences, you know, we all still deny. We still say, oh no, there's no racism. Oh no, we can't be racist. You know, so there's still that denier, you know, so the movement has really i think it has given for me and a lot of people around me that it has given voice it has given people uh, an opportunity to voice it you know people have just been able to go out there and say actually you know this is what we are seeing you know so 
while in places like Ireland, you know, physically people are not being killed, but emotionally, economically, you know, people are being killed every day. People are becoming demotivated. You know, when you see that in an island where unemployment rate was about 5.4% pre-COVID-19, to see that as a person um, who is categorized as Black, you know, from our census statistics, you see that their unemployment rate was five to eight times that of, a, you know, a, a native Irish person, you know. So, that people from the African continent in Ireland, their unemployment rate was between 43 and 63 percent in an island where our unemployment rate was 5.4 percent. That is massive. How do you explain that? You know, so for me, that is a different way, another way of killing people. You know, when you, when you, people cannot navigate the labor market, yeah. when people are not, you know, their voices are not heard, there is no space for them. You know, for me, I describe that, that that is a knee on people's necks, you yeah. know, but what it did you know this black lives matter you know um, movement it, it, i think it gave everyone you know a freedom because i talk a lot about counter storytelling that when we hear one story that story releases it helps you to be able to tell your own story you know and so it's released and freed a lot of people to tell you know their stories and to look at the parallels you know from what happens in America and what happens here, you know, and that for us to stop that denial where we say, oh, that's in America. No, we're saying here on the shores, you know, across the sea, here in our, on our island in Europe, that we too, we are experiencing, you know, that this discrimination against black bodies, it's not just something that is stuck within the walls of America, that it is happening here as well. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, during my own PhD research, which was on crime and people who are in prison, um, men serving long sentences, I became very interested in trauma and how it, you know, impacts people's bodies and their brains and their ability to relate well to other people and their ability to function, really. Um, do you think racism is a form of trauma, Ebon? Oh, I know that racism is a form of trauma. You know, uh, in my work, I talk about how experiences reconstruct the human identities. You know, like, and it's only when, what frustrates me is that it's only when it comes to race that we act like if we cannot see it. Hmm. Whatever way, whatever experiences we have in life, it reconstructs, you know, the body, the body memorizes it, you know, and it, it has a way of coming back, you know, it comes back to haunt you, whether in your dreams, it changes who you are. So in my work, I, I was able to um, draw a line between specific experiences and how it reconstructed the identities of my interviewees and changed, you know, the way they began to behave, the way they began to act, it, it changes their expectations. Expectations, it even changes, you know, uh, uh, um, their identities, you know, so it is, it is a trauma. I mean, we, we, we look at all of those things, you know, you, you know, it, it impacts on your thoughts. It just impacts on who you're, you're yeah. becoming. That's why when we started looking at COVID-19, we said that, you know, that we were hit by two pandemics. So it was not just COVID-19, but it was the pandemic of racism as well, you know? So yes, it, it is a massive trauma that is born on the body. I take phone calls every day, every day. There's literally no day, you know? So only just yesterday, I was taking a call from a girl and she was explaining, and she was in tears. You know, she had hounded me for so many weeks on, on you know, trying to send me inbox messages on Facebook just to say, I need to talk to someone. And she was explaining her experiences, you know, in the workplace, you know, and this is an organization that is well known, you know, and just, you know, how they tell her things like, oh, you know, we're tolerating you. How do you say that to somebody? And I'm saying this is not a, a two-year-old girl this is a, a mature woman a mother you know telling her that oh you know yes you know when i finish you know we'll just you know let you come on and then you know we'll, we'll tolerate you for a bit you know she resigned she had to resign you know she resigned from the job and the employers you know the, the ceo who she sent you know where, where she resigned did not even do an exit interview to say you've only worked with us you know for for one month and you've resigned nobody even called her to say why are you resigning you know immediately they said oh send in your your laptop and sending your stuff you know they immediately they took her off the the you know the the mailing list you know just immediately do you understand no like curiosity. i'm like there was just really no, 
no curiosity. And, you know, interestingly, she's the only black person in the organization, yeah. you know? And she was like, oh, I don't want to think it's race. I said, girlfriend, it is race. You are the only black person in that organization. And you've only worked for them four weeks. And in four weeks, they've told you that you, they are tolerating you. They would not say that to any oh, other person, dreadful. you know? They won't say that to any other person, you know? But again, like the key thing that happens, she's not willing to report. She's not, you know, she's like, oh, you know, I don't want to, you know? So again, it's all of those things, you know? So people, we, we don't report, you know, I they know. just come, you know, people like me, I speak with them, I encourage them and support them and, you know, help to build their confidence back up again you know i was like god you should have called me before you resigned you know because it's i said you, we can't keep resigning because every time, yeah because every time you resign you have to go down you know and she was saying that it is only in ireland because she's worked in the uk and in ireland and in worked in canada she says it's only in ireland that every time i come to ireland i seem to go down mm. you know she seems to go down you know in, in the labor market she has to go down you know and so it, it, it is hard i'm very you know? sorry. i mean i have people who have them um, yeah you know so i have people who have a phd you know um who who are working in care a phd means you have a level 10 qualification and they are working in care that requires a level five qualification this is not hearsay these are people that i'm having to support and build their confidence and say look you know do yeah. what you can you know, it's it, it hard. But to go back to trauma, it, it, that does lodge in the body. And um, I, I joined one of your very interesting discussions with a range of very super talented, interesting people a few weeks back um, about becoming an ally and becoming anti-racist. But what struck me was that, you know, when people are growing up and they're faced with racist abuse or being diminished or just not being, you know, encouraged kind of when you're a, a bright, able student that is not being recognized and nurtured in you, um, that people can get angry, but they're told, hold it in, you know, be dignified, don't respond. And in a way, that's a form of trauma, too, because there's a real righteous reason for anger there, you know, but it can't it can come out. And so it gets pressed down and becomes illness maybe. Um, and for me, that's been interesting with Black Lives Matter because people now in various countries are rightly angry and saying enough. Um, do you think though the fact that white people are joining with people of African descent um, to say this is unacceptable and we really do need to shift things somehow is that significant i i think it is significant i think that you know because so in a, in a, if, if if you look at the country like ireland you know people um, of african descent in ireland are just 1.2 percent 1.5 percent you know so our numbers you know our economic power is not enough to make that change. And so until we have allies, we have our white allies, we have our friends who will join with us, you know, to fight this fight, you know, fight this fight, you know, um, you know and, and we call that, you know, the struggle. The struggle is really for our humanity. You know, the struggle is to look at, you know, that to see people who are black as human, you know, and people try and run away from it. I'm like, no, that is the struggle. The struggle is that you do not see people, you know, um, who are black, people from the African continent, Continent, the struggle is that you still do not see them as human, mm. you know, and so we find that in the United States, we are still having that struggle, you know, where we say that uh, somebody who is the police, you know, might be afraid, you know, and might be so fearful and they release, you know, the bullets and they shoot and they kill somebody because they are fearful, but people who are black are expected to remain calm with a gun pointed at their head, with a fully loaded gun pointed at them, they're expected to remain calm. They're expected to say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. They are expected to remain calm with a gun pointed at their head. But, the, but a police officer who has a gun, you know, is allowed to be scared enough to release, uh, you know, bullets into people's bodies. Multiple you know, bullets by that mm. you know so it, it's you know that's you know different um behaviors different expectations you know uh, uh, um, from people you know so 
I think it is, it is just, I don't know, like it, it is exhausting, you know? So we look at all of that, you know, and I'm saying that it is not just only, you know, in the United States that we have that, that even here as well, you know, people are expected not to be angry because when we speak up, you know, I'm the mad black woman. Oh, you know, she's, I say, yes, I'm angry because I'm tired. Yeah. I'm tired. I'm worried. I'm scared, you know, that my 17 year old that my 18 year old and that my kids will have to, um, go through the same struggle that I'm going through. I'm tired that, you know, I have to be overqualified, you know, to be able to give, be given the same opportunities, you know, um, with other people just because of the color of my skin. So I'm tired. But what are we expected to do? We're expected to remain calm. We're yeah, expected I to not be upset. Sh don't show emotion, you know, keep smiling and be grateful. You know, and so it's exhausting. That is, a, you know, you know, again, as a that's psychologist, a trauma. I think that's a trauma. A trauma. Suppressed emotion, you know. So in my new book, I talk about that, you know, that anomaly, you know, where people have to um, suppress their anger. You know, when you have to suppress anger, you, you then depress. What then happens for you to live with um Unex unexpressed anger, you have to then act docile. You then have to become demotivated because that's the only way, you know? So you suppress all that anger, all that energy. You then have to use that energy to become just limp, you know, mm -hmm. and just go through life. You know, so that is, it's, you know, it has a psychological impact. We don't see that. Mm -hmm. But for me, and that's what my worry is, because I keep talking about it, you know, about the reconstructed identities that people who came in motivated, empowered, you know, trying to make change, you know, are not able to make the changes that they want to see. Yes. Um, it, it's, it's very, very wrong indeed. Just in an anecdote and maybe to get your advice and, and to help people kind of um, become more active. And now I mean people like me who are motivated to be better and to be allies, you know, and, and be friends to people. Um, a, a good many years ago now, maybe six or seven years ago, there was this uh, lady of African descent going to go on a bus and she and I both had 50 euro notes. Um, I happened to have change in my pocket to be able to pay the fare, but normally I booked it online and she was maybe two people behind me. And the bus driver said to her, do you come here printing those? So meaning the 50 euro note. Um, he didn't say that to me with my 50 euro note. And I was maybe then sitting two or three seats back and we all had a gulp in when we heard this young man say this, um, but we didn't say anything. You know, we didn't get up and say we're getting off the bus or, or anything else. And um, she, she did say, uh, she made him repeat it where he had to say it twice. And um, then she said, oh, that's a pretty rude question, don't you think, sir? And um, anyway, he said he was just having banter, but an American lady afterwards who also had a 50 euro note said she wanted his name and his badge number and she wasn't paying him until he got the change. And we kind of clapped for her because she was responding, I think, to the incident that happened with the other woman. What should we do in that type of a case? Um, because afterwards I spoke to the woman and I said, I'm really sorry. This was at three hours later when I got to Dublin. I said, I'm very sorry you went through that. And it was like, it didn't even happen. She, she kind of looked at me and it was like she dumped the horrible racist memory out of her head in order to be able to function for the rest of the day. You know, it was, it was remarkable. Um, but what should us onlookers have done or said, do you think, in that type of a case? I think even just to start from your last point, that she didn't dump it, but, you know, she didn't dump that memory because it was just one in a line of uh, memories. Yeah. And she knows yeah. that, you know, in the next few hours, it's going to be reenacted. Do you understand? So in the next few hours. Oh, yes. It was going to be reenacted, you know, by somebody else in some other ways you know, so that it's not going to go, you know, so, so that was just the least, you know, so it's like you eat, you know, so you don't hold that memory. Why? Because, you know, 
it is it's it's something that is going to face, be fiercely reenacted again, you know, by somebody, you know, very quickly, very soon. So that was just uh, a drop in the hat compared to you know some of the real you know um, dangerous ones that you know people have seen. And then I guess sometimes the way we look at it, we're like, ah, here, yeah, you know what, the person doesn't even know me, you know. So um, right. You know, so you just you know this is a total stranger, you know. It. No, the person, you know, so you look at that, this person is not what my sweat, you know, and so that's how we try and reason it out, you know, but imagine having to, you know, keep drops and drops and drops and drops of that every day. And that's why we call them microaggressions. Mm -hmm. So they are dropping, you know, you know, like that, you know, little tap that is dropping in your kitchen, that little licking tap, that's it. So imagine a hundred of those or 10 of those or 15 of those. One day the pot just gets so full, you snap. Yeah. or you get tired, you know, but what should people do? I think that, like I said, you know, the population of us are just so few. So everywhere we go, we're always, we will always be in the minority, you know? So until people stand up and speak for what is right, you know, don't wait four hours later, you know, it's at that point in time, you know, sometimes I get trolled on Twitter, you know, I get trolled online, you know, and sometimes, you know, people just, you know, one or two people just come and they take on the troll, you know, and so I'm able to stand back and then I don't have to, you know, engage with the troll yeah. because two people, you know, so they become allies for me online, you know. And most times I don't even know them, but they just take on the troll and engage the troll. And so that way they kind of, you know, shield me. They're a buffer. Me. That's right. They're a buffer. I, you know, and I kind of feel, you know, I feel that, okay, yes, I'm not in this alone. So at that point in time, that woman embodied that shame by herself. So when you go through this, first you embody shame. You, you're faced with shame because you're put in the limelight, but not a positive limelight, a negative limelight. You know, so you're engulfed with that shame and that shame is yours alone. But when uh, people who are bystanders, rather than being passive bystanders, become active bystanders and step in and say, actually, that is extremely racist. You know, that what you're doing now, you're selecting this one because I had a 50 and you didn't say that. Yeah. Why didn't you have that kind of banter with me? You know, the minute you say that, you wipe away the shame. The yes. shame no longer yes. becomes her own. The shame becomes the shame of the driver. Do you understand? Yeah. So you, you shift that, you know? And so what we need is active bystanders who actually take part. I was saying it with the George Floyd killing. Imagine if the bystanders who were there that day, you know, if they did not only just record, what if they did something and pushed the guy off, you know, the, the knee? The guy didn't, you know, he wasn't holding a gun. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I don't think he had a gun. I can't remember if he had a gun in his hand. You know, he had his knee on his neck and he had his hand in his pocket. You know, so imagine if somebody pushed him away. Eight minutes on, you know, eight minutes, 46 seconds. One person, three people could have pushed him away. Nobody did. Do you understand? Yeah. You know, and so racism, I think that what we have is a, is a, a crisis of care that people don't care. People don't care enough. They say they care. No, if we care, we will act. Think about it. All the things we really care about, we act. Caring, you cannot care without acting. Yeah. The things we care about, we act. We do not care enough. So for me, I've begun to remind people that racism is a crisis of care, that we have a care crisis. That's what we have. We don't care. And it goes back to where we have started from, that we do not see these people as human. If we saw them as human, we would care. You know, one day I was joking. I was like, if there was a person who is black in the middle of the road and a dog, and you could save only one person, I would be afraid. If the person to save is a white person, I would be afraid because I wouldn't know. I wouldn't be able to put my hand to my chest to say that the person will save the black person, the person who is black over a dog or a sheep or a goat or a cat. I would that, be afraid. Yeah. Wow, that is a tough, way to live in the world to be fair to 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 not have that sense of confidence um because i think most people who are white would not have that worry you know they they i don't think they think about it and that obviously is white privilege that you don't have to have these 
types of scenario or thoughts going through your head. Like I worry about my kids all the time, um, like not in a sort of over super protective way, but just, you know, you love them and you want what's best for them. But I don't have to worry about those microaggressions 10 per day or whatever. I mean, it's yeah. horrific to think um, uh, as, as a mom, as a parent, loving one's kids and not being able to shield them from that. Um, so everyone, just to go back to schools now, like kids don't become racist um, by themselves. These, these views, these not seeing fellow humans as equally human come from the adults in their lives, um, I think, who they love the most or who model certain behaviors to them. Um, and and um, parents obviously have a key role, but teachers also have a massive role in shaping young minds. Do, do teachers get training on cultural and racial issues? Um, do you know? And, and, and if they do, does it need to be a whole pile better? You know, does it have to be delivered by people who are of African descent or other ethnicities as well, rather than white Irish people who might have read a few articles about it? Yeah. And again, I think that if we go back, you know, just one of the things is that racism, as we have it today, none of us created it. We inherited racism. So I'm getting to try and remind everyone that the racist world that we have today, we did not create it. I didn't create it. You didn't create it. My racist neighbor didn't create it because none of us is four or 500 years old <laughs> and racism is as old as 500 years. So that's number one. So we did not create it. However, racism is an inherited space. So we have inherited racism. We have inherited these racist ideas, these racist policies. And so the stories that we tell you know, so from our parents, from our neighbors, in our education system, in our books, in our museums, you know, in our curriculum, we pass down the stories of white supremacy, white superiority, and black inferiority. So we pass down the stories, and that's how we teach our younger kids. We teach our, our young people. So it's not just parents, it's our education system, you know, our teachers, our museums, our curriculum then teaches um, young people um, that this group of people are inferior. We save them, that these people are a burden. They are the white man's body. We save them. You know, they are not human, but we allow them to be human. That's what our education system teaches. So to be a racist, you are not born a racist. You are taught how to be a racist, you know? So we inherited it. That's the first thing I'm saying. But what we do, we our inheritance is up to you, is up to me, is up to the teachers, is up to the parents, is up to every one of us, is up to the, the provost of the school, is up to, you know, we've inherited racism. But from here on in, what we do with this inherited racism is all us. Mm -hmm. Is all us, is all you, is all me. How we choose to respond to that is all us. So, yes, we have a part to play. You know, I think that our educators. If, you know, some places say they do, but they don't do enough. It's not enough because what they are taught is a, is a Eurocentric knowledge because our education system, think about it, ask all the people around you, our education, you know, and that's why I ask the question all the time, what are the good things you've learned about black people? You know, there's nothing. You know, so when we go back to our education system, the African continent is seen as a problem and as a burden, you know, so the, so that whole system has to be overhauled. You have to get people from the continent or people who can teach in a non-Eurocentric way, you know, about the continent of Africa, you know, and the knowledge cannot just start from the deficit of blackness, but it has to start from, you know, go back as far as, you know, you know, the ancient Egyptian em empire, you know, to look at, you know, the, the Mali empire, the Benin empire, look at music, look at science, you know, how does somebody come out being a psychologist and you've never, you know, you were not cited any black, you know, authors. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, you, you come out, you're a doctor, you've not read, you know, um, any of the, you know, you know, 
people from the continent, you know, from the African continent, how they participated in the development of science. Mm -hmm. So you know, your system teaches you how to be white um, superiors. You know, I think who was it that was saying that, you know, our education system really actually is, you know, the education system in the West is actually generated to raise perfect white people. Right. To raise superior white people people it's not to raise you know black people it is to raise superior white people and so when you look at that you know when you see all of that you know then you begin to see um you know where we begin to learn you know white superiority you know and that's what it is you know so unless and that's why you know i teach black studies you know and that's why africana studies was started in the united states you know to to bring it it actually started out being seen as black perspectives mm -hmm. you know to bring in those black perspectives you know there's a, an african um, um proverb you know that says until the the lion tells the tale you know the hunter you know you know you look at the hunter tells the tale from his point of view sure. where he's victorious you understand he's the warrior you know but the lion will tell you a different tale and how he scratched and how he fought and how he stood his ground you know you yeah. know so nice. that's it so, so our education system only tells us the tale from the point of the hunter even today as academics it is so difficult for us to get published because you know i'm a our uh, materials are stripped and stripped and stripped and stripped of all, you know, the critical consciousness until it sounds like a Eurocentric, you know, you yeah, almost yeah. have to sound Eurocentric, you know, um, Fanon calls it, you know, black skin, white mask, you know, so that we are all even almost expected to be like, you know, with our black skin, you know, with, to be white masks, you know, so yes, all of those things are there and it's constantly um, navigating those spaces, you know, one of the things I've been advocating for, you know, I said that, you know, like first year, all first year students in universities must be taught a compulsory uh, module on um, anti-racism, you know, you know, so, so it, yes, why not? That, yeah, you know, so a compulsory module, you know, on how to manage difference, you know, so that where you can bring in all the different voices, you know, so whether you're a doctor, or an architect, an engineer, you must participate in that module to help you understand, you know, society, to help you understand humans, to help you be able to manage um, difference, how to be, you know, my work and in my book, I talk about that. I talk about don't teach people how to tolerate difference. No, I don't want to be tolerated. You don't want to be tolerated. I don't want my, my religion or my food to be tolerated. Neither do you want your hair to be tolerated, you know, <laughs> or, or, you know, your choice of clothes. Yeah. You know, you want it to just be accepted that it's my choice. I know you don't like it or it's not, it's not what you would use, but that's your choice, mm. you know? So, so in my work, in my new book that is out, I talk about um, accepting that what we should teach is how we should be accepting of difference you know so rather than teaching toleration teach you know how to be accepting of difference you know and where we are not imputing negative judgments you know on people's difference you know i think it was dubois that talks about it where he says you know um you know that how does it feel to be a problem 